Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the country's biggest stars. And one of my favourite comedians at the moment is Alan Cochran. He's a man who is incredibly warm and friendly. Well, he's going to be, isn't he? He's from Murfield in West Yorkshire, where he grew up. But born in Glasgow. You couldn't get further apart, really, could you? Well, I used to do lazy jokes about it making me officially the stingiest man in the room being Scottish and Yorkshire <laughs> at the same time. But uh, thankfully, I've moved on and I don't do quite so much broad regional stereotyping these days. <laughs> <laughs> still funny though I mean it might be offensive but still funny yeah I've noticed that I told a joke while saying I don't tell it anymore that's, uh, that's how to butter your bread on both sides isn't it <laughs> what I love about you you've got that charm about you I just spent um, a year at Radio Leeds and what I love about the Yorkshire people is is their dryness and their warmth at the same time and it's sort of I'll forgive you for anything you, you've really brought that oh, to your act haven't you that sounds good yeah I'd like that I should try and work on using that a bit more that sounds ideal <laughs> I think it's a bit late to be working on anything the axe what it is now isn't it have you heard of the Japanese theory of Kaizen of gradual daily improvement I think there's um, <laughs> there's a lot to be said for, uh, for trying that in stand up comedy like if you if you haven't got an entirely new bit at least just uh, tweak the bits you have got that's um, that's a good system I find that evolving is quite exhausting as a human being I'm, not, I'm just going to stay as I am take it or leave it yeah, well, that sounds like it could work for you as well. You know, it sounds easy, that's for sure. You know, I look at you online, and the great thing about YouTube, of course, that's where we're talking to you via now. Your stuff lives on forever, and of course, that appearance on Russell Howard didn't do you any harm. And so many of these programs, those clips live on, don't they? Do you know what? You say that, but I seem to be one of the comics of my generation whose stuff gets taken down off YouTube. I've had a few people, somebody... Um, texted me the other day a promoter that was trying to show somebody else that worked in their office or an old bit of mine I think it was actually the bit from Michael McIntyre's Comedy Roadshow which for a while was up on YouTube I never put anything up there I just let other people kind of find it if they want mm. um, and, and I did a, a story about seeing someone eat a peach and drink a full can of Red Bull on a train and, uh, <laughs> and it was a funny bit and, and they couldn't find it on on YouTube now I think someone's taken it back down I'm not quite sure what the rules are it seems to be one rule for one and one rule for another doesn't it yeah I don't know what the system is but um, either way it seems like some of my bits that could be living on for eternity are not any longer <laughs> right but yeah I did Russell I've done most of the stand-up shows really I, I, I you know I've had bits and bobs on there over the years that other people have told me oh that's on and, um, and none of it's really gone bananas in terms of those some people get mega hits, don't they? They get like mm. millions, but I've never been up there. Maybe those ones would stay up. Perhaps it's just a popularity contest. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. It, I'm learning a lot during this interview. I know. I should start this again, really. It's not going so well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about those panel shows you've done, some are more combative than others. I mean, never mind the Buzzcocks seems okay. Um, Have I Got News For You is very, very different. And then, of course, Russell Howard's about you doing stand-up. Are, are there certain shows you prefer to go on and you would, for example, if you were asked to do 8 out of 10 Cats or that Mock the Week, would you have a personal choice? Well, I've done those shows. I've done each of them about five times. And they're fine. I just think it's tempting, in a way, to say, oh, they're too mean to each other or everybody interrupts you. And that can be true. But also, I think the truth of the matter is there are a way of funny people going on telly these days. Um, and that's just how it is. Just, you know, get over it and go on them or don't. Like, it's up to you, really. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't think Mock the Week is an especially good program. I think the reason that it works is that comedians are sometimes funny. I don't think there's anything about the program that is that remarkable. Like, I don't think the makers of the show have ever done anything hilarious or interesting whereas I think the makers of Have I Got News For You have done things that have been really quite um, trailblazing when they had the tub of lard on instead of Norman Lamont that was actually <laughs> like a moment in comedy history that they decided to do whereas Mock the Week is just you know, so it, it, the reason it works is that if you put seven comics together, sooner or later, someone will say something funny. That's just how it works. That it's all about comics being good, Mock the Week. And I know, you know, if, if I was in late at night and I wasn't a comedian, I would probably put it on when it's on day. But there's no point in me watching it now because I, you know, I am one. 
so it's not really for me, is it? <laughs> is it formulaic, is then? Is that what you're saying, that it's sort of become sanitised? I remember Dara telling me once that the problem with the programme was that when they had Frankie on, he'd do two hours of stand-up and two hours would be edited out. I don't really know what the problem with it is. And it, to be honest, I don't even really think about what the problem with it is because it's just a TV programme, isn't it? It's just a, it's a way of comics going on telly and telling their jokes and people either like them or don't. And I don't, I don't really mind any of those shows, but I don't, I, I don't think it's very sensible for me to sit in and watch them because uh, it doesn't really feed the machine. If, if I'm a stand-up, it's much better for me to you know, read a paper or a book or or do something else or watch a drama just feed the machine you know put stuff in that, that I can then regurgitate as my own stand up rather than watching my peers and think that should be me up there right <laughs> What I do love about your style is that you take the absolutely small things and you make them huge and you take the silly things in life and bring that to the stage and it's incredibly relatable. I know this is a cliched question, but do you think being from the North gives you that perspective? You don't see many London comedians doing that. They're talking about politics and important things. Do you think so? I don't, um, I don't ever really think about it in terms of uh, regionality. I just think, to be honest, it's mainly laziness. The thing that you just <laughs> is my laziness because I'm not a particularly political or topical person I mean I do read the papers and I've got bits of material in the current show that is about stuff that's happened this year but for me I just think why would I do material about stuff that's really uh, obscure unless it's full of good jokes and you know to be honest there's a, there's a slight pain barrier. I did a Radio 4 series that was sort of a stand-up tour of my house, and uh, <laughs> quite a lot of the jokes in that I tried out at proper comedy clubs, and I wasn't introduced as trying in material for his Radio 4 thing. And so sometimes I would just be on in front of 200 people on a night out in the north of England, and I'm spending 20 minutes talking about my kitchen work surfaces, and they're looking at me like, what the heck is this? And you just have to make it funny, but I quite like it when it gets really microscopic. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, weirdly, the, the more tiny it becomes, the more bigger the appeal, because part of the joke is, I shouldn't really be talking about this for this long. And, and strangely, you can make a game of how focused in you get. And so even if people don't care about your germs on your chopping board, if you're talking about them for that long, they start to care because they think this, this is silly, this is just a long game. Yeah. It, to a certain extent, stand-up is a, is a parlour game, really. But it takes great it's confidence, nice. and what I love about you is you look so at ease doing it. I'm sure the things I've seen are where you've polished it over time, but when did that point come where you felt like nothing could go wrong on stage, and even if it did, you'd have an answer? It still hasn't, to be honest. I, I, I think um, when you drop stand-up from your repertoire and you replace it, it's... Uh, it's quite a hard thing to do because you sort of feel, I was equating it earlier this year to a bit like driving a car with no fuel in it, you know, when the fuel light is on yeah. and you're thinking, oh, oh no, I can't really enjoy this drive because I really need to fill up. That's what it's like being a comedian that's just ditched all his material in order to have a load of new stuff. Right. Um, and like, you know that even if it's going well, you think I could still run out of fuel at any moment. I can't afford to enjoy the view. Whereas, you know, perhaps a year later when you've got a load of new stuff that's working, you can kind of have a look out the window, even in a choppy gig where there's drunk people and, and someone interrupting, you think, oh, it's fine, I've got tons of stuff, we'll, we'll get there in the end. <laughs> but no, I don't, um, I don't ever think it's going to be feeling like it's finished. I once said to a comedian friend of mine years ago that I just felt like I needed three big lumpy bits of stand-up for that year's Edinburgh show. And, uh, and then I sort of paused for a moment and then thought, actually, I think for the rest of my life, I'm always going to want three big, lumpy new bits of stand-up. So, yeah. so, um, Is it torturous then, being you, that you never sort of make it? I mean, a painter, when he paints the picture, can put it on the wall and it lives forever. Sinatra releases my way and can sing it forever. You can't do that, can you? Because as soon as they've seen it once, you've sort of got to recreate something new. Is that a torturous yeah. existence? Um, I wouldn't say it's a torturous existence. But it is one of the downsides of stand-up as, a, as an art form is that it's never fully finished. You know, <laughs> even bits that are great, like, you know, somebody mentioned 
mentioned an old bit of mine to me over the week and I thought oh that was, that was really good that but I couldn't do it now I just wouldn't be able to because it was two or three years ago when my life feels different so now I say things that are more current my stuff has a very strange shelf life that's peculiar to me and uh and it is, it is a shame sometimes that there isn't closure on it. It would be nice to have closure. That's why I, I quite like doing them bits and bobs on TV and radio because if you've got a bit that you haven't recorded yet and you know that it's firing and it's really fun, it's good to, it's good to do it and get a document of it in a way, do yeah. it on a TV show and sort of stop saying it live and start working on the other stuff. Is comedy changing again at the minute? I mean, I was just looking at Alan Carr's website. and changing. It was interesting how people wanted to do six nights in big arenas and then go away with their millions. It seems like they're going back to touring again, the little theatres. Has that arena thing stopped now? Have they realised that it's watching it on a big screen and we might as well just wait for the DVD? I doubt it. I think, um, I think the thing about arenas is that you know they, they started because there was an appetite for them and then there's people that are kind of, to a certain extent, ambulance chasing and they're going in the arenas because somebody who's more famous than them went in arenas and they want to too. Right. But, I mean, to me, I don't think my stuff would be very suitable for an arena, even if there was the appetite for it. But I think worse than putting yourself in an arena is putting yourself in an arena and then realising that you're not selling it and having to reduce tickets. I mean, that right. is, that's a big ego working backwards, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it is. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's wounding. You said no when, yeah. when your boss is said, oh, we could put you in the arena and you'll make a million quid in one night. Like, you should have said, well, what if we don't sell it? Wouldn't that be awful? <laughs> you know, to, you really, five nights in a nice theatre would be much more fun. Um, but really, I, I, I think your, your point is interesting. And actually what it proves to me is that um, stand-ups want to do stand-up because a lot of the people that do arenas, they've got enough money, they don't need to carry on doing them like Ricky Gervais is still doing stand-up and he doesn't need to you mm. know Jerry Seinfeld you don't get richer than Jerry Seinfeld in no. comedy and, the, and he still gigs like there must be a compulsion deep down in stand-ups to stand in front of people and say look at me say funny stuff because yeah. they don't have to why else would they do it you know Bill Cosby's still going I mean goodness sake uh, you know there's, uh, there's just that thing of I think weirdly stand-ups once they make money at it they kind of go oh well when I started this it was my hobby and now it's kind of my hobby again there's a fantastic bit on um, you know Grace Perry did the wreath lectures where he was talking about being an artist and being yeah. an artist today and uh, there was a great bit in it where he was talking about people saying oh it must be such fun being an artist it must be such fun and he pictures a huge empty art gallery and, uh, and him having to create all the work that fills it up and then all that work having to sell to keep the staff of the gallery and the associated <laughs> staff in business. And then he said, at the end of that, people wanted to go in and have fun as well. <laughs> like, and I just think that's kind of, in a way, what it must be like. Like if you're an arena stand-up comedian and somebody says to you, all oh, right, we're gonna get 12,000 people to come and watch you do a new show and you're gonna make this much money, and then you go, yeah, all right, okay. Then there's still a point where you have to sit down with a blank pad of paper and a pen and go, what am I gonna say? Like, <laughs> what am I gonna say that's gonna make 12,000 people laugh? That is an undertaking, let me tell you. Um, so, you know, it's it's not necessarily fun along the way, but it's fun once you've got it and then you say it. That's the, that's the fun bit. But the bit beneath the visible bit of the iceberg is the is the tricky part. When you say, when did you relax? When did you realize that it, you've, you've got enough stuff? I just think, you don't know what we're hiding. When we're, yeah, <laughs> when we're yeah, standing yeah. there going, hey, what do you think about bed stuff? Like, you know, <laughs> just, there's so much going on. No, I totally get it. And for me, it's interesting. I've done some stage work and I, I can't imagine anything more intimidating than working in front of 14 people or walking in front of 14,000. It's, it's a different form of terror, but the terror's still there, isn't it? I suppose so, yeah. I take it as a big compliment when you say that you, you kind of can't see all the, the workings happening. But weirdly, my, my background is quite traditional. I started off as a juggler and I was really interested in um, kind of quite heightened performing. I, I went to drama school. I was at Butlin's Red Coat for a little while. I've, I've done kind of quite mainstream entertainment in, in the past. But my stand-up feels 
very, um, uh, what's the word, naturalistic. It feels kind of like, you know, I'm sort of hiding that there's any work been done, really. Yeah. Um, and so it, it feels sort of, in a way, kind of modern, but then I suppose it isn't really, because it's still a bloke just saying funny stuff. It's not like I'm there with a slideshow and any kind of odd, you know, I haven't got any Twitter stuff. I'm, I'm kind of a, a fairly simple creature. It's just a bloke behind a mic talking. Um, and I quite like the fact that it's... Uh, I agree, but to do that so effortlessly and make it look so effortless is the great skill, and that's what I loved about you and the reason I asked you to do this interview today, and you should really take the compliment. That ease on stage is so rare, and that's the reason you should go and see Alan Cochran. He's uh, touring the UK next year. He's also coming to the Soho Theatre in November from the 11th to the 15th. You can find out more by going to his website, which is www.alancochran.co.uk. That's with a U, A-L-U-N. What's all that about then? Very pretentious. It's actually the Welsh spelling, but I'm Scottish with an English first name. It's deeply confusing to me on any given day. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say, I didn't have many Alans ring me on radio leads with a U. <laughs> me neither is the new tour. Um, he's brilliant. Go and see him. So natural, so relaxed, so brilliantly funny and uh, rare as well. And original. Congratulations on that. Really brilliant. Alan Cochran is uh, the big man of comedy. Visit him at alancochran.co.uk at the Soho Theatre from the 11th to the 15th of November. Alan, thanks for your time. Thanks very much for that. Cheers.